first of all, I'm thrilled to be here um, to talk to you today, and I want to basically convey two major themes in the next 10 minutes. The first is why I adore my job at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and the second is going to be about why I think that the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the leadership, the faculty, all the trainees, the staff, and all of you together are poised to make an unbelievable impact on cancer treatment and, more importantly, cancer cures. So first, I just wanted to tell you that I have three jobs at the Dana-Farber, and those three jobs are something that get me out of bed every day, incredibly excited, and I'm incredibly enthusiastic. My first job is that I'm a pediatric oncologist. So I take care of children with leukemia and lymphoma with a special interest in those children that have relapsed and refractory leukemia and lymphoma, the hardest to treat varieties. The second job is that I'm engaged in discovery research, which means that I myself focus um, in a laboratory of my own at the Dana-Farber on the interface between chemistry and cancer biology to try to drive fundamental new understanding about cancer and then turn that into new ways to treat it. And the third job, which is very important also, is that I'm the director of the Harvard and MIT MD-PhD program. And that's a program that is laser-focused on inspiring and training the next generation of physicians and scientists at Harvard and MIT. And so I feel like my job encapsulates the mission of this institute in the sense that it's clinical care combined with discovery research, combined with training and inspiring the next generation through teaching. And I have to say that being asked to do this this year was very timely for me. Because what I want to share with you is that since being here in the year 2000 is when I came to Dana-Farber, I had the most fulfilling experience of my career this past summer. And it starts with my first slide, which is a picture of a little girl by the name of Catherine, nicknamed by her family as Catherine the Great. And I met her in the year 2000, and uh, I met her in the emergency department at Children's Hospital, and I told her mother that she had leukemia. And her mother grabbed me by the shoulders, literally, and shook me, and articulated this commandment, which I will never forget, which was, I will see you at her wedding. That was the first thing she told me. We're not quite at the wedding, but this is a picture of Kat Catherine, who now, by the way, goes by Kate. Um, and she is now at the University of Southern California on full scholarship, started her freshman year just a few months ago. And before going off to college, she emailed me and said, you know, I really think I want to be a doctor and I want to be a scientist and I want to understand what that is. Can I work with you in your lab at Dana-Farber? And of course I said, yes. And so watching this 17-year movie, seeing someone with their whole life ahead of them and all the potential that they have, and then watching that flower to this point, and then having her work with me in the lab here, side by side, as she herself is now turning into a scientific and a clinical thinker, there really is nothing better than I can share with you about this type of academic life that we live. But I also want to share with you this. So this is a quote from another one of my patients. She wrote, though negative, worrisome thoughts continue to cross the minds of myself and of those around me, I cannot, will not let these things discourage me. I keep fighting in isolation, but with people and prayer and support and love and faith enveloping me, I stand alone, overcome by loneliness, but at the same time smothered with love and support. I cannot worry. I cannot let this win. This soon will be over. I will have defeated it. I will live. I will find the courage and strength to be me again. This was written by a 16-year-old with relapsed leukemia who hits it on the head in terms of the issue of having all of that support from family and friends when you're going through a cancer treatment, and yet at the same time, you still feel completely alone because you have to go to bed at night and get up in the morning by yourself to deal with this. And what's even more striking about this for me is that this note was given to me by um, her mom, who found this note under the pillow of her bed when she was facing an unbelievable complication that ultimately took her life. And the idea that a child, a teenager, even when the handwriting was on the wall, that things were this bad, 
that she still thought that we were going to come in there and fix it and make it right. And for me, that's the energy and commitment and fervency that we come to work with every day to say, let's not have to read about unfulfilled hopes and dreams of a 16-year-old. And so when I finished my training here, and I decided that I was going to go into a laboratory, I joined the laboratory of Stan Korsmeyer, who many of you know. And he was a world leader in research on cell death. What determines whether any cell in our body decides to live or die in response to daily stress or in response to the stress of chemotherapy during cancer. And he taught us that there are straightforward, fundamental questions that are unanswered in cell biology that directly relate to cancer, and we have to figure out the answers. And the question that I focused on with him was this fundamental issue, what determines whether a cell lives or dies? Stan himself died 10 years ago from lung cancer. But before he did that, he inspired a whole generation of trainees to think about these issues. And his mantra was, laser focus on these questions and come up with new tools and new technologies and new techniques to figure it out. And don't think about the short term, think about the long term. And so when I started my lab, and that was in 2006, I focused on one protein. It's called BAX. This is a picture of it. It's what it looks like. And this protein is essentially like a grenade sitting in every single one of our cells, including cancer cells, except the pin is firmly put in place. And if you're a cancer cell, you don't want anyone touching that pin, right? Because that grenade is a risk to the survival of the cancer cell. <coughs> And so the fundamental question was, and I keep saying fundamental because it's so central to understanding biology of cancer, what turns that on and what turns it off? And in 2006, we had no idea. But when I worked with Stan, we came up with a new type of reagent that we call structured peptides or stapled peptides. And when I started my laboratory, I used it as bait to try to find out where the on switch was for this. And in 2008, we published a paper in Nature that pointed to the on switch for this protein. What does that mean? That means that now we know how to pull the pin on this protein. And now we're actively figuring out ways to make drugs that will do that for us when we want to turn this protein on. Now, just this year, a few months ago, we used new technologies to answer the other question. How do we turn this off? We used the staple peptide technology to find now the off switch for this protein. Why is that important? The toxicities of cancer therapy, where you want to turn on death in some, but make sure that the normal cells, the death process is turned off, you need to know where the on and the off switches are for cell death. And now this year, we have our first glimpse at where the off switch is on this very same protein, again, with the roadmap for being able to develop drugs to manipulate whether we turn on cell death or turn it off. What do we do with this? This is really basic science discoveries. Well, what we're doing with it here is essentially the new secret weapon of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. The secret weapon of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in 2015 is the Longwood Center. The Longwood Center was an idea that was cultivated by Dr. Benz, Rollins, and Stan Korsmeyer with the idea that if you take chemists and structural biologists and proteomic specialists and cancer cell biologists and mouse modelers of cancer and translational biologists with all of their expertise about how to take drugs and move them into patients, now all of a sudden, under one roof, Imagine what we can do. And this idea was piloted around seven years ago in the form of the Lindy Program for Cancer Chemical Biology. At that time, three faculty. With the idea is, what could we do if only we had this kind of support 
to blend all these fields together. What could we do? What we did was, and this is myself with Jay Bradner, who many of you know, and Nathaniel Gray, we published 300 papers with the names of 58 scientists that we hired, 49 research grants that we brought in, over 250 patent filings, 38 licenses, eight new startup companies, six investigational new drugs at the FDA, one with breakthrough drug status. This was the pilot experiment. These startup companies have gathered around $300 million of external funding taken together. And now this pilot is full steam ahead as of March 2015 in the Longwood Center. And if you haven't seen it, and if you haven't been by to talk to the people that work in it, I urge you to. Because the excitement and the dynamism that is emerging from having all of these people together, it's remarkable. It's the future of the impact that we're going to have together on cancer treatment and cancer cures. So I thank you so much for all of your support. It means so much to us. And trust me when I say that we come to work making sure that every dollar that is invested in what we are doing matters. And it matters because we know what a cancer cure looks like. And we also know what a cancer cure that we can achieve today looks like. We don't want to read notes under pillows from children whose hopes and dreams have not been fulfilled. We're going to do better. Thank you.